Guys, thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of A Wild Time Podcast. I am Adam Newsom, and I just want to thank everybody for tuning in. Thank you for the subscriptions, the likes, the shares, everything. Last week, we had Wildfire Tommy Rich on, and if you have not seen that episode, I strongly suggest to go see it. Tommy Rich was as over in the South as Hogan was up in North in the 80s, and if you're a fan of professional wrestling, if you're a fan of the history of it, watching Tommy Rich in this interview, just be himself is downright awesome. So go back, check it out. Tonight's episode, all the episodes are brought to you by Bose Tractor Works, a CBD cream. Like I said, I have put it on my elbow all night. I mean, anytime I work out, I've got to have this cream on and it's a miracle in a jar is what I've been saying. So Bose Tractors Works, get up with it. Appalachian Hills 11. Thank you, weird ass hot dogs. Get up with Richard Burchett, and he'll fix you some of the greatest and weirdest hot dogs that you have ever ate. Tonight, though, I don't want to keep this beautiful lady long because, like I said, we were talking before she came on. She has got to catch a flight. She's always on the run. She's got the energy of a 16-year-old, and it is absolutely an honor to have her on. Tonight, she is at House of Hardcore Staple. She is an extreme legend in my opinion she's the renaissance lady of the indies at the moment a horror spring queen she is a beautiful strong mother also which i want to talk about that she makes some of the coolest crafts and she will smack you in the face and send you out of the ring too quick to talk about ladies and gentlemen giving up for the original oh my bad the original gotta monique dupree and the bo- monique how's it been going Fine. Thank you for having me on the show. First of all, I truly appreciate you. Oh man, thank me for nothing. Like I said, I I've, I've been reaching out to you for a time. You stay busy. Like I mean, your I, schedule is hectic, and I've been keeping up with you um, for a long time. I mean, you've got a lot of inter. inter I'm a. We're cut from the same claw. I mean, we're yes, and we have history. Yes, that's that's what we were talking about before this show. Sometimes it's it blows your mind. Sometimes I mean, we were talking about. Um, Shoot, we'll just start it off with that. I was yeah. at a, a convention in Gatlinburg, and this was the first, anybody that knows, I'm a human horror movie and professional wrestling. So this was my first horror convention that I ever attended. And I'm at Diamond Dallas Page's table. This is probably 11 years ago. And this is before yeah. the DDP yoga exploded, which everybody really hit. At. Yes. So I'm talking to DDP. It's just like me and my friend Jerry at that moment. And he's got his laptop. This is, I mean, he's on a laptop showing me the stuff. And about that time, I swear to you, it was almost like the lights went out, the music hit, and here comes Monique, the original goddess strutting in. Comes right up to Diamond. I mean, he screams, he like stops, you know, selling me the DDP yoga and comes up, you all embrace. And he's like, hey, I'll be, we had a good time last night or fun time, something like that. And you was cracking yeah. up, you walk off. And I'm like, dude, who was that? And he did, he said, that was my girlfriend. And then he went back to selling the yoga to everybody. <laughs> but I was just like, man, that was so cool. And then you were trying to remember, you said that, that convention. Yes. Because that was one of the best uh, times I had had at a convention appearance because it was like a lot of my, so my, the wrestling community and the horror community was all one for me at that convention. And it was my bliss because it's two things that I love, professional wrestling and horror, you know, all in one. And then they treated us all so well. And uh, we had Brian O'Halloran there and Sid Haig. And the night before we were at um, uh, Hard Rock Cafe in Gatlinburg, and we all signed something to go up on their wall. And it was just, it was an amazing time. So by the time we had gotten to the convention, everybody who didn't know each other was family, even though I knew Diamond Dallas from before. And I knew he was doing DDP yoga, but I didn't know like the inner workings of it. I just knew that he's the reason for my weight loss. He inspired my 82 pound weight loss. Man, and a lot and of people... Was- That's a really, that's a really important piece of my interview tonight because you have stayed in like unbelievable shape. Your physical, I mean, the way you've taken care of yourself is mind blowing. 
Like it's you, you are as, I don't know how to put it, <laughs> but you yeah. are in great shape. I'll put it like that. You know, Thank I, you. I, I, <laughs> I appreciate that. I don't get to tell people very often uh, because we go off onto other topics, but since you introduced the topic, which I appreciate you for, <laughs> DDP was the reason that I got inspired to really lose the weight. Uh, I I knew him and we just talked and he was like, I, I just have this thing that I'm doing. And, you know, he was basically, he, he tries stuff on himself first. It's not like he believes in what he does, but he believes in it to the point where he does it himself, which yeah. if you don't know already, you know, you should go and see. But this was in the beginning stages. This was in its infancy. And he was just like, listen, you should leave all of the, you know, regular cheese alone. I do sheep, cheap cheese. And I was like, sheep cheese, that's mm -hmm. some disgusting. You know, I was, I, <laughs> I was not for any of what he was telling me that I should do. Uh, but then I started slowly implementing these things. And it's another reason why for him, he looks so much younger, especially to me, yeah. than his actual age, because he got rid of a lot of things that will naturally age you faster. And we had the opportunity to talk about these things before DDP yoga actually became a thing. When it was in its infancy, he had, uh, he sent me a, a DVD, like all these DVDs with all of these different yoga techniques. And I started to do it. And I got involved with it for a little while, but because of what I was doing, it was harder to do the yoga, but I just implemented some of it and most of his dietary practices that he taught me and it just uh kicked lost like my my goal for losing my weight never did I think I would lose 82 pounds but I I did I actually trained myself I I got my certificate so I can train other people and he started all of that for me and so I'm forever in his debt for you know, the self-motivation that he gave me to be healthy in life, like not just about trying to have a six pack or something like that, but just healthy so that I can live a nice, long, healthy life. It's a lifestyle. Like you said, I mean, it just, it is. it's a lifestyle. And I, you know, I work out four days a week, but my diet is crap. I'm not even going to lie. Like, I wish that I could get that under control, but it's almost like, man, it's too, I mean, it's almost so expensive to eat right. I mean, it, it, yes, it, you're, you're not even, you're not even lying. And I have 10 children, so it's so much harder for me, especially our house burned down almost, well, a year ago, I think yesterday, yeah. our house had burned down. So we're starting over, we're doing all of these things and trying to cultivate everything again. It's hard. And I, I say it all the time. It's so much more expensive to eat healthier. It just, it just is. And anybody that tells me I, I don't know what I'm talking about doesn't see my grocery bill. <laughs> That's so. if I can cash that check, man. It is me and my wife. She got into fitness back last summer really big, and she started going to a personal trainer in the gym um, because, you know, I train kids here. I, I train boxing, MMA, uh, weight training for local kids, but she nice. didn't train at her. She was like, if I was like, man, let's go down and work out. She's like, no, I ain't going. I don't feel like it. But if she was going up here to uh, Kelly's, uh, she was like, all right, I got to go work out. She did awesome, man. But when, when it came to meal prep and it came to putting everything together, it really, man, it, it, it hits the pocket hard. It, it and it's a shame because you should be, you know, you should pay less to, to be healthy, you know. Yes, you would think you would think that's the case. That's one of the reasons why I am very adamant about I shop at a lot of different places. I will go to Dollar General and the dollar store because the dollar store has a lot of healthy um, snacks in a way of like uh 
peanuts and, you know, dried cranberries and stuff like that. Those are things and pistachios. Yes. Those are things that I take with me when I'm traveling so that when I'm on a plane and I'm really hungry before I get on a plane, I don't eat like a bunch of crap. It just yeah. depends on if I'm treating myself or or what, because it's just been stressful. So sometimes I do stress eat. Uh, I'm not even going to lie because I'm not. I feel like I'm not in the shape that I was because I lost 82 pounds then I gained 10 pounds. Then I lost four of the 10 pounds. So I have six more pounds now that I need to lose for me to be me happy. Right. But listen, not to for, you, know, you don't have to worry about that. I mean, I promise you, I know how it is. Trust me. I know because we hold ourselves to a higher um, standard than, than everyone else. You know, yes, when you, you get do. When you get that four pounds off, you're gonna be like, all right, I'm a world champ. I did it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I just wanna I just wanna lose it for me, especially, you know, I am approaching 50. And that is for a woman in this business, that is a a, a hard number to approach. I don't feel that way, and I, certainly I don't act that way. Yeah. But it is still my number age. So I feel like a lot of the reasons why I get pulled down with with, you know, outside people is because they might see or hear my age and they they cringe. But again, I always lean on DDP yeah. who got into the wrestling business into his 30s. Was it 36 that he got in? I, I believe it was 36. It was 35, 36, something like that. You know, mid thirties. Yeah, I mean that's not where people start their beauty, wrestling career. The beauty of this day and time, though, man, is you look at Jennifer Aniston, you look at all these beautiful, uh, eight, you know, women that are. I mean, they're more over than these twenty. Tina Turner. Ten, gosh, don't even get me going. I'm heartbroken, man. Angela Bassett. I know. I know. Halle yeah. Berry. We, you you're know, just, you're rattling off some beauties that stood just, the test of time, man. Just, you know, especially Angela Bassett, who played Tina, Tina Turner. Turner. She has this body that, like, won't quit right now. How and, Stella got her groove back. I, I watched a lot of that on Showtime when I was like in seventh grade. That was always on Showtime. Yeah, I was when I first saw that. I was like, whoa, <laughs> this woman. Is amazing, and now especially, you know, it seems like the the older she gets, the more fit and beautiful she gets. Yeah, it's a it's it just teaches me that age is just a number, and I know that I've always felt that way, but you know, I still am so very physical. When I do movies, I want to do my own stunts. And that's what I was. I was actually going to ask you that because do you still take bumps? Yes, I do. I do still take bumps. So, well, when House of Hardcore ended, I didn't take anything because yeah. <laughs> House of Hardcore ended. Oh yeah. Uh, and it ended due to COVID, and it was just really hard, to, um, you know, for us to get it back up again the way we wanted to like dreamer could have gotten house of hardcore together but he doesn't half-ass anything right. so if we were going to get it together again he needed it to be the way he envisioned it and if that wasn't going to happen then he's not going to do it because you know dreamer is a visionary mm -hmm. he's amazing at just about everything he puts his hands on you know so house of hardcore was truly uh becoming more and more of a success and i don't know if some people know but there's a lot of people that were mainstays in house of hardcore that are now in aew and wwe you know these are people that you know he saw should have an opportunity to showcase their greatness that he saw before anybody else saw it. And he would give them a, a, a mainstay on House of Hardcore. I mean, the videos don't lie. They're all there. <laughs> and, you know, the people got a chance to see them 
and see their greatness and pick them up for these these bigger shows. And I'm so happy that uh, that company was able to do that. And I can only, I feel like if we were able to get House of Hardcore going again, that we would actually be in competition, not in competition, like in a bad way, but you know what I mean? Like yeah. we have all of these shows going on, but we would be, you know, one of the names of mm -hmm. the shows, you know, like an impact. You know, uh, Major League Wrestling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like I really wish we could do that again, because that's also where I learned everything. Uh, Dreamer taught me everything. I got a crash course. A lot of people don't know, but even though I've been a fan since I'm eight, I hadn't trained before I started working for him. Yeah, uh, I did. So he had a House of Hardcore Academy and my daughter trained there. And then I trained for a little bit, but I just I mostly took care of all the social media stuff for what he was doing to show people that they should come to this school. Yeah. And then we started doing the shows, too. And I I started working the shows as a valet first show with. <laughs> ECW's own Sandman. First time I'm ever in a ring. Sandman, Guido, and Blue Meanie. How can you get any better than that? Man, that's a great feeling. I worked a show with this is a pretty cool experience, though. That was your first show, right? Is that what you were yes. saying? My yes. first show for a specific company, I was through into a six man tag where me and Shane Douglas and another guy took on Sandman and a tag team, a local tag team. Well, Sandman, right. I mean, he did not. I mean, just think about how easy of a night this is for Sandman. All yeah. he has to do is hit. The crowd pops. He comes through the crowd, comes into the cage, canes me, canes the other guy, walks out. They hit two uh, splashes off the top rope, and they just pop. I mean, it's just an amazing – I mean, that's an easy night, you know. <laughs> I love that man so much. Let me tell you, he has him being by dreamer side a lot and being at a lot of the house of hardcore shows. He taught me a lot of the nuances of the business that other people may not have spoken about, or, you know, I don't know if they were willing or not willing, but he always kept on me. He wanted me to be better than I was the day before yeah. so every time we came in he taught me something new and different and if he didn't see me do it after i came back behind that curtain he told me about it but it wasn't being judgmental it was you're better than this i want i you know i want you to be better i want you to do this and i love that man to this day right now every now and again i'll say something on my facebook and like maybe once a month, he'll just comment. And I'm like, <laughs> dude, I didn't even know you still are on Facebook, let alone <laughs> commenting on my, my stuff because it's just how he is. He just comes in, he makes his appearance, and then he like, I'm that's, out. That's it. That's and, it. It. and you know, Gata, in this business, it is so cutthroat. Nobody wants you to get ahead. So to have guys that are proven veterans – teach you and take you under their wing, man. They seen it in you. They seen your char charisma. I can't even talk charisma. They seen your beauty and they were like, you know, this, this woman's got it, man. I mean, there's something with her. And, you know, you take, you go back to dark journey in the eighties. I mean, she was yep. a great black, uh, beautiful woman that came out with Tully Blanchard. One of my favorite valets ever. I mean, Jacqueline, I love the Jacqueline. Yes. And, and she stayed in great shape also, you know, talking about. Oh people, yes. yes. She stayed she in great shape. He absolutely did. I mean, it's, it's, I'm not going to say it's not so hard to do. It is hard to do. The older you get, especially the harder it is. But I think when it's, uh, when it's muscle memory, when you're so used to doing it, that you just, you do it in yeah. some people, even if they're not uh, actively working anymore, this is what they do because like I do so many other things. And when COVID hit and I couldn't wrestle anymore, I just, I worked out. I worked out. 
I did burlesque from home, which is a whole nother thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just wanted to showcase that I'm still actively doing things, you know, mm -hmm. and I do have to say, like, while we're talking about wrestling and this platform that, you know, the the three people definitely that have always had my back and that has helped me so much has been Tommy Dreamer, Sandman, and Mick Foley. Yeah. Love Without you. those three spirits, I don't know where I would be in wrestling as far as, you know, how they believed in me. And Dreamer believing in me with entrusting his company. Yeah. Me. It's one thing to entrust somebody as a wrestling talent, but it's a whole different animal to have somebody that you can trust to co-run your company, your whole company with you. Yes. Like, I, mean, they, I mean, the promoting you were doing, because I, you know, I was doing my homework and you were, you were head over the, the uh, social media, you know, all of it. That's a All big deal. I mean, that's a game. At the shows, at the sh I was actually the one uh, putting the tickets on sale online. I had to, to manage all of that. Uh, my daughter and I, when we went to certain shows, we were the ones taking the tickets at the door. And then we would have to run and I'd have to go help like the talent because I did some of talent relations with him. And then I had to find out what my spots were. Cause then I'm, I'm in front of the camera as well. And then I had to take pictures for social media in between. And my daughter would help when I'm doing running around, she would take pictures because you have to put stuff on social media as it's happening yeah. and not just once it's over. Uh, then when we had Twitch, forget about it, because I was literally sitting there moderating Twitch and running around with my laptop. People would be like, who is this crazy woman running around like she would lost her mind, especially when we were at the old ECW arena, because I felt at home there. But that was a that was a whole thing. And but the thing is that I loved it. That chaos was uh, not chaotic to me, if it makes right. any sense. It was very calming for me because I'm used to managing a household with 10 children yeah. and, and, and running multiple businesses. So doing that and doing something that I love and having the, you know, being in a profession that I love was, was just a great thing. So now I'm embarking on a, a new uh, journey with new wrestling revolution uh, out of, they're out of Decatur, Illinois, but we're moving to Peora, Illinois as of this weekend. So wow. now I'm trying to work with this company like, I worked with Dreamer for House of Hardcore. Well, they've got the right person. I mean, your um, your qualities are you've already helped them, and you know TNA. It seemed like House of Hardcore and TNA. There was a lot of exposure there for a little bit. There were some team ups. Oh yeah, we did. Yeah, we did a lot of. Uh, there was a lot of crossover uh, between. Uh, we did Impact and Impact Plus because yeah. uh, Impact is one whole thing and then impact plus was their online content so we would do crossover to both so i had the opportunity to work uh impact as well and then even when we weren't doing house of hardcore i had the opportunity to do impact because i was traveling with dreamer a lot um i still do sometimes but when i would go i would just do these spots especially with moose it yeah. was like that just fell in line all the time. I did uh, some pay-per-views with Moose. Um, I've worked with Madison Rain with a couple of uh, spots. Like I would do a lot of spots like that. And then afterwards do some behind the scenes work, like, um, you know, uh, post matches and, you know, doing some videos and stuff like that. Like I just, I think I might love behind the scenes just as much as I love being in front because, I love the production end of, of things, especially with wrestling, because yeah. I, I think it's because I get to connect with 
the wrestler and their personality and what they're doing and what they want to convey. And I get to be a part of that. So I love that as much as I love developing myself yeah. in front of the camera. It's it's kind of like a, a win-win situation for me. <laughs> so, I mean, the I was going to ask you, the original Gata, how did you get that nickname? How did that come about? So it was just Gata initially. Yeah. Um, and I've had Gata for a long time. So my whole life has been a, a connection with cats. Yeah, that's cool. And Gata is just a... a a Spanish term for cats is usually gato. The female iteration is gata. Yeah. And uh it used to be I was cat for a long time. Uh it's just a nickname that my husband kind of developed for me. And then uh gata came later when there's this I can't remember his name, but he's a Spanish artist. And he used to draw me all the time. And I still have it somewhere. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna send it to you just so that you see it. Gotcha. And he came from a small village uh, in Italy, and they called me Gada. He called me Gada, uh, and they called me Gada, and it, it kind of stuck. And I also had a, a an ex an ex friend. She's she used to be a friend of mine, and she loved cats as well. So we both kind of enveloped the term Gata around the same time that I was doing conventions. It was like, just like Monique Dupree, AKA Gata. Yeah, and then cool. it became the original Gata, but then there, there became uh, problems with, <laughs> with the name, so to speak. And I had to trademark my name. So I talked to my husband about how I should trademark it to trademark it correctly because all I want is Gata. Yes. That's, that's who I am. That's my name. Are you going to pull uh, a warrior? <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, I love all my fans started calling me the OG and I love that. Like, yeah. I I love that more than I love Gata, the OG, uh, because it's the original Gata. Yeah. <laughs> but um, he we looked up the original Gata and it was the true original Gata that we had to trademark. And since I had been doing different ones anyway, we trademarked the original, the true original Gata. But Gata is just, it's just simply, that's okay. who I am. So uh, my ring light, my ring light is a cat right now. Like my ring light that's right behind me yeah. is a cat. Uh, all my tattoos are cats. I have leopard prints. That's I just, cool, man. Yeah. Um, a cat followed me home one day when I was a kid, when I was going through a really rough time in my life. And I felt like cats were the only beings I could communicate with because I just kind of had a, a hard time growing up. Yeah. Uh, and that's where a cat came from. That's where the original name cat came from because cats started to follow me home. Like literally I would have, I felt like I was cat woman. Yeah. They would literally start following me home. And I lived in an apartment building. So I would bring cat food around the corner to them and leave it out there. And they would know when I'm coming after school and just be there waiting. I have an affinity with cats, I feel like I understand them and they understand me better than anybody else. You know, that's wild too. We're going to have something else in common. I'm going to explain to you. So my gym that I've kind of got down here for the kid, local kids is called the Bears Den. The mm -hmm. reason that it's called that, it goes way back. My dad, do you remember Dan Severn? I'm, obviously, I'd say you do. He was UFC. I do remember that name. Okay. He's got a big, anyways, my dad favored Dan the B Severn. Well, all my friends, Thought it was the they started calling him the bear instead of the beast. So that kind of and my dad let me try, turn his garage. I was supposed to win on an MMA reality show, and I was like panicking because I didn't have nowhere to train. So my dad let me turn his garage into an MMA just mats on the floor, weights, punching bags, and I just started calling it the bears. Then that's been 10, 11 years ago. Anyways, fast forward now, and um, 
I've got the, you know, I've been blessed enough to have more equipment, more st- uh, bigger plays, and I've just caught up the Bears then. We've always kind of – we're big, strong-looking men, just naturally broad guys, hairy. Um, so, me and my wife and son, I, you know, I always called us the bear, you know, basically. So, I went and had some work done. and Oh, see, wow. That's kind of my little boy I always said, my wife and wow. me right there. That's intricate. That yeah. is amazing. Amazing. He did a really, really, he's a good friend of mine, but he put some really good details with the sky. Yes. The detailing is amazing on that. Wow. Yeah. But anyways, kind of like you with the cats. I, I'm kind of that way with a, a grizzly bear, I guess you would say. It's uh, that's, that's definitely me. I have, I, they're just in a lot of places that I can't <laughs> show, but <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I have cats all over my body. I have black cats just all over and then the leopard print. And it just means so much to me because I feel like uh, people think it's strange for me to say, but I said, I feel like uh, cats saved my life because I mean, that's, that's awesome. Was, man. Yeah. The way you take, you know, like you said, you t- was taking care of them, bringing food. I'm a firm yeah. believer, man. If you're a good, good people, good things happen to them. You know what I mean? And you've lived a very, yeah. you've lived a very interesting life. man. I mean, honestly, definitely, definitely I, interesting life. And I, I appreciate, I appreciate the good times and the bad times because you know what? The bad times that has happened. Make you appreciate the good times even more. Absolutely. Because how do you know what's good if you don't experience the bad. And that's why I say, you know, I know it's, it's been a year and our our house burned down and we lost most of our stuff. I had a whole room filled with nothing but cosplay, you know, outfits. And now I'm starting all over again. So I have maybe two or three and I'm just kind of piecemealing stuff together again. And it's just really, really rough to go from being a homeowner to renting again. It's just all really stressful. But I choose and I do a lot of um, I do a lot of videos on my TikTok. I don't do like TikTok challenges and stuff like that. Yeah. I know people think I might be boring, but I feel like there's some people out there that need to resonate with what it is that, I, you know, I'm feeling, too. So I go on TikTok to send messages, even if it's a message that says, I'm sad today. I feel depressed. You know, even people that are out here, you know, in this business or trying to live their best life, we go through depression too. We go through things. You and I both know that there is, you know, celebrities, you know, and wrestlers specifically who have taken their own lives. Uh, depression is a real thing and you can't look at somebody and go they're suffering from depression so I feel like it's important to have somebody to actually say it and even though I'm not like a WWE talent or something like that and they you know they have people sometimes that cut promos or whatever I just want to be one-on-one and sit in front of the camera and be real and say, I'm having a great day. I feel great today. You know, I'm seizing this day. Or if the next day I just feel horrible, I feel sad. I feel like crying. I want to go and say it because depression is a real thing. And not every day you're going to feel great and not every day you're going to feel bad either. Mm -hmm. But I feel like we need somebody out here to say that it's okay to have these ups ups and downs that you don't have to pretend that everything is great all the time because it isn't i don't care how much money you have i don't care how much prestige you have i don't care where you're living or how you're living you're going to have ups and downs and i think it's important for people to start saying it out loud and so i'm just one of those people i even if nobody watches it well, I watch it because every morning, you know, when I'm I'm scrolling through Facebook, you know, say, I, I think the other day you said, say good morning or something, say it, yeah. you know, and yeah. 
And in my late twenties, I'd never suffered from anything like emotionally wise out of nowhere. I was hit with a panic attack in a dump truck. Like I was driving a dump truck and I thought that I was dying. Like I didn't know what was going on. Yeah. And I was, you know, there was a couple of days where I was kind of like, man, what, what I thought I was dying. I thought something seriously, which it is, it's mental health. And, uh, I ended up getting myself kind of, uh, I was battling anxiety and there was a moment, there was a moment where I was almost like in my house, scared to go outside, scared to go lift weight, scared to train. And I'm kind of like, man, what's going on here? I was borderline, you know, I would have, I'd start crying. I was, I mean, I was a mess. And then I started realizing I started, you know, going on online and going to YouTube and, and there's so many people that suffer with, and hold it in. And it's the worst thing you, you right. like you said, you need to talk to people. You right. need to be there. You need to let somebody know, hey, listen, you ain't alone, man. I go through this too. Right. And I understand that there's a stigma attached to it because most of society will still try to condemn you for saying, you know, I I feel down. Yeah. I don't feel great. I don't, I don't, you know, a lot of society will still condemn you for that. But, you know, if I have to be the one voice and I'm not saying that I'm, that I am because I feel like more and more people are starting to, to say it, but I try to, I try to live it by not just making a post and then going about my business, but keeping up, you know, daily, weekly, however I can do it when I have the time to ask questions or to speak about things. You know, I even said one day, cause I was talking to my sons and one of my sons was like, well, you know, I wasn't sure if it was okay to cry Yeah. as a man. And I was like, are you kidding me? That's sad, man. Yeah. I was like, for me, that shows that, you know, you embody being a man. Yeah. You should be able to still have whatever emotions you need to have. And crying is cleansing. Don't ever look at that as being weak. And mm-hmm. any, you know, there's been guys on my TikTok that question what I said. You know, men are not supposed to cry or cry in public. I said, I never said anything about in public. I'm not telling you dictating where you need to do that. What I'm saying is that if you need to cry as a man, me as a woman, and especially as a black woman is saying that if I see that, I see that as a sign of strength. I don't look at that and go, you're so weak because you're crying. And my son gave me that reminder that that stigma is still out there. It is, And it made me do that video to say, you know, men, it is okay to cry. It is okay to get your emotions out there. It is okay for you to process them in that way. It does not make you weak. I feel like it makes you stronger because you get the opportunity to cleanse yourself as opposed to holding things in and lashing out at the wrong things. Yeah, I agree with you a hundred percent. I mean, you just get the nail on the head. I mean, like you said, it's a, and it's a different time of day. I mean, used to the state, like you said, the stigma is still around, not as much as it used to, but more and more celebrities are coming out speaking about it. You know, Kevin Love plays basketball for uh, Miami Heat. Now he had a panic attack on the basketball court. And what he described going through is exactly what I, I mean, exactly yeah. what happened. And he said, he just went to the back and laid down and just had a meltdown. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, if you hold no. it in, you're, you're a time bomb just waiting to explode. I mean, you got to get yourself together. And he, he has a lot of pressure on him. Listen, we live in a day and age where there's just a lot of pressure, period. We all experienced the pandemic together. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of us had better opportunities than others, meaning, you know, there was some, celebrities i was laughing because arnold schwarzenegger was in his pool with like these ponies or horses or whatever they were and he was just like stay indoors don't go out and i was like well shit if i had all of that i would stay indoors too (laughs) it's a little bit different coming from all of mr (laughs) sports It's a little bit different coming from Arnold than it is Steve up the road. (laughs) Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, I was like, 
I'm not in your situation, sir, where I would be home too and never leave my house. I would just play with my ponies, you know, <laughs> but it was, it, it's just, there's, we all went through it together, you know, no matter what, nobody was exempt from getting COVID. I know people in my family that's passed away from it. Just, we all went through that struggle together. So I feel like we're all kind of on edge yeah. and life keeps life in. It keeps throwing like real life shit. At, have you seen yeah. New York today? I went outside and went to the store this morning and couldn't breathe coming back home because of the smoke, smoke. from the fires that's going on in Canada. Yeah. I was like, I can't breathe. I got home. I was crawling up my steps. I was so dizzy. And I'm I'm in Baltimore. I'm not even in New York. If I were at my apartment uh, in New York, like it was orange there, like like apocalyptic orange, yes. <laughs> you know. So we're we're all going through a lot together. Mm -hmm. It's okay to have to release. Don't hold it all in and think that you have to be so strong all the time stress will kill you from the inside out that's a fact it will man it will it will cause i mean it's i can only imagine the amount of heart attacks that the stress is called i mean caused yeah. I mean, it's just but you know we have sit here <laughs> we basically we've had an emotional time on here tonight yeah i'm sorry we, we <laughs> no, to be talking about listen your wife has been a we could do a, a trilogy on this podcast i mean we just went <laughs> But this is the beauty of this. It's a conversation. It ain't an interview. It's a conversation. Whatever we throw at one another. Hey, listen, pandemic talk. We all went through it. Yeah. It, was, it was a specific time in history <laughs> that is never going to be forgotten. We got, but let's let, you know, I'm going to go into this next one because listen, you've got to get up in a few hours. So we don't want to get you tired or we don't want to let you get on that plane tired, but horror. Let's talk a little about horror. How did you get involved in the horror movies because I love it man you were in trauma films I mean yes I well I love I love trauma films that's like I feel like the highlight of my career because of Lloyd Kaufman yeah. but I I first got into well I got into films because at 13 I did Lean on Me yes I was about um, with the great Morgan Freeman one of the best movies ever Yes. And I got to I got to be in that movie with my brother, uh, Tony Todd, and I got to meet uh, like Lynn Thickpen and Robert Guillaume and just a lot of the the classic some that are not with us anymore. But when I was on that set as a kid it was the moment I knew I wanted to do film yeah. specifically. Um, just the, and it's weird because it was me as a kid working 12 hours a day where my, my parent had to sign off for me to be able to do that because you needed parents permission and all of that stuff. And it was an amazing experience. And I got bit by that bug. And I just wanted to do it more. Yeah. So then I started doing extra work uh, for a lot of different movies. Uh, I mean, I was in the replacements. I I did, uh, I did so much. Um, Handsome Harry that came later, but like I did a lot of extra and like uh, featured extra roles. Uh, I met Mario Van Peebles on the set of um, Law and Order, which. That was when I started getting into television to try to see how I like that. Uh, I like film better than television, but meeting him and being able to 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 work for him, you know, as a character uh, with Vivica Fox, that was amazing. Oh yeah, so, I can imagine. But I got into horror because I decided to do a Fangoria radio contest. <laughs> Where D. Snyder and Debbie Roshan, I don't know if you remember, they had a Fangoria uh, radio. Was that on Sirius or XM? Yes, it was on, yeah, yeah. I think it was on Sirius. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I remember. Um, well, this was a long time ago, uh, before like 
I think before it was like Sirius was really like a popular, popular, like it is now, you know? Yeah. Um, so it was Dee Snyder and Debbie Roshan, and they were doing a screen queen contest. And I had been trying to get into horror for a bit, but I was having a hard time. So I had done a couple of movies, but, you know, it was nothing. So I just said, well, I'll go do this contest. And I that's where Lloyd Kaufman was a judge. Yeah. And there was like five of us. And I thought it was going to be a contest based on like acting ability and stuff. But it was literally who can scream better. Scream queen kind of deal. Yes. Yeah. Like a literal scream queen. So I did. I introduced myself. I did my scream and I lost. Uh, I I was like in second place or whatever, but all with all that mattered was who was in first place. So I lost. But afterwards, Lloyd came up to me and was like, I love like what you do. Yeah. And who you are. And I would love for you to be in my movies. And I'm like, for real? Because I just lost. And then I took a picture with him. I had a big rhinestone choker that says sexy. But when I took the picture, all you could see is sex. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm standing next to Lloyd and I got this rhinestone choker that says sex. And I'm <laughs> <laughs> I just remember that because I was like, that's so weird. <laughs> but, um, but I went on to do like intros to trauma movies with him. And he introduced me to other people. And then Debbie Roshan started to put my name out there for movies. And my brother, unbeknownst to me, and the next thing I know, I was just doing like horror movie after horror movie. I would go on set and people would see my ability and was like, oh my God, you play like the killer really well and then would refer me because I was never really the victim. I've always yeah. played the bad guy. Well you've got a reason. you've got a a unique intimidating look to you. You know what I mean? So That's I mean what people keep saying to me, but I I I don't I don't see it, but I guess the the tomboyish thing too and how, how I talk to people sometimes I think I don't know. But I'm like, I'm a sweetheart. Yeah, you're a great human being. I mean, Catwoman. Thank but, you. I mean, but I mean, as far as your, you know, you've got that charisma. You've got that. You would be more in a Rob Zombie. You know, you'd be one of his killers just due to your, you know. Absolutely. Your look instead of a blonde haired, you know, white girl running, screaming. You know, you've got a strong. So I can see that. I mean, would you like to play I, the victim once or the heroine? Well, I I would like to play both once, uh, but if I had to, I said this a long time ago, I love being the female Danny Trejo. Oh, that's, that's a good comparison. Heck yeah. I like that. Because most times when you see him, when he shows up, you go, uh oh, <laughs> who he about to kill? Business or is about to pick up. Something's, something's going to happen. That's bad. Something's unfolding. Uh, very rarely does he play like a like a good guy, or you know, maybe an anti-hero or something like that. But I am okay with, and I've met him twice, and yeah. I told him that the first time I ever met him. I feel like I'm going to develop to be the female you, and he he hugged me and he was like, "I hope so." You know, <laughs> you got the look, and I was like, "Thank you." You know. And we took our picture, but yeah, it was, it's, it's a, it's a thing. I am typecast, but I am one of those people that's actually really okay with being typecast yeah. as this person. I mean, in wrestling, I'm always the heel. Yeah. Like, I just, I feel like I do so much good in my real life. And it's just like, well, now we would like you to murder, like all the people on set. <laughs> just kind of crazy and I've done over a hundred film and television projects and 90% of the time I'm always the villain villainous yes <laughs> all, you know when I got into pro wrestling that was what I want to do all the guys that I looked up to and admired and, and were my heroes were heels and I was like man I'm gonna be the baddest heel ever 
Well, the crowd took to me so much out of my antics that they just turned me like my promoter. I walked to the back one day because I would just like grab pops out of the fans' hands, drink them, throw them. And I went to the back and the promoter was waiting on me. Ken looked at me and he's like, dude, he said, you're, you're the big, in a year, you're the biggest baby face in the company. And I'm like, no way, man. He's like, you're the worst heel ever. He said, they love you. And I was like, I can make them hate me. He said, no, you're genuine. They <laughs> like me. He said, you're an anti-hero. And I was like, well, you know, whatever happens, happens. And he was right. The crowd changed me, man, to baby. And I was like, I, I wanted to be a heel so bad, man. <laughs> It's okay, cause I, you know, I, I was trying to feel out what, who we were going to be. I knew what Tommy wanted, but it's always about what the crowd ends they, up saying. They're the and, judge, right? And I feel like the crowd has always loved to hate me and my daughter, uh, cause we would come out as the double D Duprees. Oh, that's they awesome. loved to to hate us. They loved to wait until we came out and like boo us. It, it's always been that way. I think it's kind of one of the reasons why New Wrestling Revolution has, um, you know, made me the commissioner. Because, mm -hmm. you know, when you're the commissioner of a company, you are not always going to make decisions that people are going to like. And even if you like somebody, you have to uphold what it is that you say. And it might get dirty and it might get nasty. And it has. Yeah. So uh, I love that position that I have now. And I hope that uh, I get to keep it. I'm proud of you, man. And you will. I think I think you've got the right head on your shoulders. Your heart's in the right place. You want to help a, a young company get up and going. You've got the power to do it. You've got, like I've said 10 times, you've got the charisma to do it. I'm, you're going on a mic. So they need you. They need, you know, that veteran that veteran uh, have leadership. I mean, bottom line. I, I I really, truly appreciate you for that. I just, I, I was talking to Tommy today for a pep talk on just making sure uh, I was going down the right road because, you know, we all doubt ourselves. We all, yes. you know, that's, you know, that's, human, that's the human side, man. We all, yeah. Are. Yeah. It's a it's 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 a, a lot of pressure at times, but the thing is that I never it never feels like work because I love professional wrestling. Like I just really sat and realized that the majority of my life has revolved around wrestling. It's the like majority a mob. Of you never get out of it. You never get it's, out of it. I know. It. It's it's <laughs> I mean, but for me to be a fan for as long as I had been and then have the opportunity to be a part of professional wrestling, I don't care how minute or how large, whatever the span is, the fact that I've I've been able to work the other end of it and lend something different to it. I mean, my daughter and I, we... We were the first, as far as I know, and, and even Dreamer, the first black valet team. I mean, you only need one person most times to be a valet, but we were a valet team. Yeah. You know, and we, and we're clearly we're black. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I've never seen that before. Not in any professional wrestling i've watched yeah i seen i've never seen, i mean now that you mention it and i've watched wrestling all my life i've never and it's unique that's the thing it about it. one word describe to me when i think about monique dupree i think unique a uh a, a game changer man a chameleon i mean that's just the way i i see it i i really truly appreciate you for that and i i i appreciate tommy for seeing um talent because anybody that knows him knows that he picks talent yeah he, he picks people so when he really said i think you have the talent for this i was like me really like i've you know seen the people and then he still to to this day have just like put so many people out there and i just i love and appreciate what i do in in a perfect world I would love to be able to work at a big company behind the scenes, maybe not in front of the camera, 
my dream is kind of to work behind the scenes for AEW. That would be cool, man. And you know the thing about Tommy Dreamer is I've never met Tommy, um, but I've watched a lot of his documentaries. I've heard a lot of the other workers talk about him. He's got like his heart is in it. Like he, oh, in no, pro his, wrestling. He, his, his whole heart is in it. Even if he doesn't want it to be yeah. at times, we all, we all fall victim to the, you know, our highs and lows, but right. man lives breathes and bleeds wrestling so so that tells me right there if tommy dreamer who all these guys speak about having the heart for the business because it's well documented the sacrifices he made for ecw i mean honestly yeah. like i mean the dude and he's still to this day though may, i mean you know and 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 he did he made a lot of sacrifices for 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 ecw and he's he he was the heart and soul That's like one says but he still to this day is still doing his thing. And I don't think people realize how important and, and pivotal he's been still in professional wrestling right now, yes. today, you know, to individual wrestlers. I don't care what company they belong to mm -hmm. and to impact who he works with just he is at, he, they have to induct him in philly if they don't there's something wrong with professional wrestling if this man does not get his due yeah in freaking philly that's the place year. to do it has to, i mean it makes perfect sense it if, it does i mean he's it, another guy he's another guy like steam that you never hear the other boys talk bad about like they ain't got a bad word for him you know he's he, and Sting's another guy like that, you know. I think there's one incident I heard where him and Dick Slater got in a fight. But other than that, like, nobody. He's professional, does business. Yep. I mean, just not like – one, Not one bad word. I'm going to tell you, that man is my best friend. Yeah. And during the pandemic, we got on the road together. I mean, we were traveling together anyway. Um He's done so many shows per year. Like one year, I think I traveled with him like 40 or 50 times out of the hundred and some odd times that he traveled. But during a pandemic, we would drive together to Nashville. Yeah. Uh, which is a long ass drive. Oh, yes. Yeah. Nashville, six you, hours from here. You get to know somebody. <laughs> During a long ass drive, like for sure, that. <laughs> that man lives and breathes professional wrestling. Well, we need he to start the campaign to uh, to make sure they get him inducted into the Hall of Fame in Philadelphia. Because I mean, I would goodness. be the I would be the number one supporter of that. I guarantee you that because it is he he deserves that, and it, he's not looking for it. He never he's very humble. Yeah. And, and but that's another thing that I love about him. But you know, it's you contributed so much to this business. Business. Let let the business thank you for it. You know, as a kid growing up in the Attitude Era, like I had to get there was like ECW catalogs that you had to order. Like they were right. just, so I got two tapes, double tables, ninety six maybe I can't remember. And the one where Kimono Wanalea strips on, on the uh, the ring breaks. So, Polly, yeah. you know, that situation. Yes. But I was big in these. And I'll never forget, man, if I had to, like, the top feuds of the 90s, you're going to have Austin and The Rock. You're going to have Sting and Hogan. And then you're going to have Raven and Tommy Dreamer. Absolutely. Think about, think about the storytelling. I mean, I could go on and on about that. Think about the storytelling in that, you know, Raven was and Tommy went to the camp together as young, and Beulah was, you know, their love interest. It was real good storytelling. Yeah, yeah, it it really was. I I've had to sit between Dreamer and Raven at many of conventions. <laughs> but that was a heck of a time to be a fly right there. <laughs> <laughs> Just, yeah, that. That was interesting times because, uh, you know, we do a lot of conventions and stuff like that. Well, I still do a lot of conventions. He doesn't. 
uh, yeah. do as many anymore, um, especially with 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 impact. But those were I just I I always say that um, the stories, everything with professional wrestling got crammed into my little, you know, 11 to 12 years that I've been on the other end of things the stories that I have that I have here that yeah. I'm not going to put out there. I'm just like, those are wow. Yours. Yeah. It, yeah. But it's, but, but then when I hear some of the wrestlers tell these ridiculous stories, I'm like, they're not so ridiculous Yeah, because I've seen lived a lot through of some, <laughs> you with the, some of the things that, that they actually tell out loud you would think there's no way that happened they're over exaggerating no no nope not at all not even a little bit this is i thought that acting was one of the craziest professions that you can get in but now i feel like it's professional wrestling is number one and acting is number two yeah pro wrestling is a different breed of humans and you know the thing that i have i have seen in this business is you find either really great human beings in the business, or right? You find lower, you find real cutthroat. There's nobody. It's like ah, he's a pretty good. The, guy. There, there's no real. There's no real in between guys. I I don't think I've seen any people that's just uh they're just okay. I he's all right guy. <laughs> like you said, it's 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 high and low. Yeah, you, and I mind I mean, my I, damn I, business when it's low. <laughs> <laughs> But you've got, like I said, man, you've got to get on a plane in a couple hours. Go do your thing. You're a hustler. I mean, awesome woman. But I wanted to give you a shout out before I go into these random questions. Um, you make really good jewelry. You make really cool stuff. Like I seen on your page the other day, you had earrings of Freddy Krueger's gloves. And to me, that yep. was killer. That was awesome. Thank and you've, you. got, you've got several different just cool stuff, man. Reasonably priced. I mean, you really got something going there, man. I've pushed that a lot because a lot of, to me, a lot of kids, heck, I mean, I liked it too, you know, and I'm a 38 year old man. I mean, just the stuff you got going on. Um, but kids, I, I can imagine elementary kids wearing some of those cool earrings or bracelets and stuff. That was the first thing it was, I mean, I was just cool, but I wanted to make sure and get that out. You know, guys, listen, she's got some cool stuff to sell. She's got some awesome jewelry, killer pictures, hit her up because God knows I'm going to, I'm going to get a picture to put down here and, and something cool for my wife. Definitely got to do that. Thank you. I'll send you a picture. You just let me know which one you want and you got oh, that. You, I appreciate it so much. Sis. Now here we go. Fast questions with the original Gata, the cat lady. I don't know how fast of an answer they're going to be, but let's, let's see. Let's, let's hear it. Here we go. Polly dangerously. What? Paul E. Dangerously. Paul Heyman. What about him? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Crazy. Crazy. Raven. <laughs> I like that list. Something funny was it? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I don't know if I should say it out loud. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. So I'm supposed to be saying the first thing that comes to my mind? Yes, first thing. And it has to be funny because that reaction was priceless. Naked. Okay, I've heard stories of that from other workers <laughs> also. Next one, Medusa. Um, humbled. Medusa was like, she was one of my favorite valets ever. And she was the type that could beat you up or, you know, escort somebody to the ring and look beautiful doing it. Yes. My hero, Ravishing Rick Rude. Sexy. All right. I had his son on two episodes <laughs> ago, Rick Rude 2. Yes. You check that out. He just actually won a couple of days ago. He won a bodybuilding contest in Georgia. Solid, solid guy. Wanted to get in business at a, earlier on. And it's it's a really good interview. Rick Rude Jr. Awesome. Brian I filmed the loose cannon. I I would definitely uh okay. I'm sorry, I was still stuck on ravishing Rick Root. Oh, uh, listen, but, I could talk Rick Root all day. <laughs> uh, yeah, because I cause cause I can too. I you know, sexy was how he got me. 
And then, you know, watching him wrestle after that was 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 something else. But when I first saw him, it was just like, sorry, it's just supposed to be one answer. Uh, That's fine. No, listen, <laughs> it's the first thing that comes to your mind. How about that? We'll change the game in the middle of the game. <laughs> okay. Now, you were going. You were saying. Brian Pillman, the loose cannon. Uh, loose cannon. <laughs> I, I mean, what what else did you expect me to say? That's it. I mean, and you know what? He was he was instru instrumental in my first character. I was the ticking time bomb, and mm -hmm. I drew a lot. I basically ripped off Brian Pillman because I didn't feel comfortable doing a ladies' man gimmick with the Rick Rude, you know, and that was who I really kind of – I would – in high school, I had a bathrobe I kept in my locker. And I would, as a joke, wear it down the hallways, put my hands on it. I mean, just do the whole face nine yards. Just to, yeah, like, the whole, yes. So the everybody around me was not going to buy me being astonishing Adam Newsom. So <laughs> I went with a ticking time bomb and uh, it got over. I mean, it did. But Brian Pillman, you know, his son kicking. I mean, he's he's doing awesome right now, Brian Pillman Jr. Um, so next question or next person, Doink the Clown. Oh my God. Weird. Weird. I'm gonna say evil. I mean the the first doink clown doink clown. Oh. <laughs> I mean, I know evil. I do horror. I mean, weird and evil can kind of share a a similar depends on how you're looking. Right. Like the terrifier that. movie right now with art. Yes. Yes. I kind of see yes. an early doink influence. I know it probably ain't, but being the pro wrestler we are, you know, we can see that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've I've said something similar and I've not gotten anybody to agree with me, but it's okay. Like I said, it's all about perspective. I think that's why you do this. You want to hear yeah, people's take everybody's perspective. Brains. I'm a I'm a I'm a bit of a weirdo and an eccentric. So I think I see things kind of differently yeah and i like picking your brain man because like i said we're cut from the same claw you're on, definitely on a higher stage than i am but we bleed the same blood i guess you would say yes we we do we do <laughs> next one booker t awesome Love <laughs> a lot of his entering work i ripped off to the sidekick the scissor kick you know when i got in the business i was like man i'm gonna wrestle like uh you know, I'm going to wrestle like Rick Rude, or I'm going to wrestle like the Great Muda. Like, I'm, yeah. you know, and I, I'm not as athletic as the Great Muda. And then, as I started learning my craft and stuff, I actually picked up more from Scott Hall and Booker T as my entering work. So, real odd how... how I love came. Booker T, because Booker T has so much um, zest and, and energy, and I used to just love watching him when he is, like, spin a Rooney, and he just, he just, like, and every time I've met him, you know, he's just like kind of cool and 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 humble. And then he gets in the ring and he's just this whole other personality. Yeah. And I just think he's 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 awesome. He's overall just an awesome person in and out of the ring. So okay. I say awesome. and I want to give you a chance to put Tommy Dreamer over because I know he's an important person in your life. So the first, you know, tell us the uh, what you think of Tommy. Uh, eccentric, but I say that in a, in a good way. Uh, again, if there is anybody that really exudes professional wrestling, or if there's anybody that you ever ask, who do you think was born to be a professional wrestler? Because we're not really born to be these things. Yeah. I would definitely say Tommy Dreamer. Tommy Dreamer, one of the uh, nicest guys in pro wrestling. He, it's well documented. He he really truly is. Thomas Lachlan is just a regular guy that just wants to be to himself. And you know, not really engage in, in in anything else. Tommy Dreamer is pro wrestling all the time. 
Yeah. If you're driving down the street and history happened anywhere in that vicinity, he will point and ask you what happened here. <laughs> He's going to give you a test right on the road. <laughs> yes. He will watch professional wrestling before he goes to bed. Great eye for talent also. He is he is phenomenal with looking at somebody. He this is why he's beneficial for seminars. Yeah. I don't understand why more people I've gone with him to so many seminars uh where he's he's pointed to different people who wanted to know, well, what do you think of me? He is such a eerily on point judge of character because I've seen some people become what he said that they would yeah. or would, you know, become. He's just overall um, what you, I feel like he is the very essence of what professional wrestling is as a whole. Yeah. Um, he might not like do the high flying stuff like Rey Mysterio and stuff like that, but he can you know, tell a story in that ring, and that's yeah, what it's all he about. He tells a story with with being in the ring. He tells a story. He's really good at everything behind the scenes and picking out people who can be the next great this or that. Yeah. Um. You know, he hired John Cena. Wow. You know. Yeah. Uh. He. he He's just an amazing, I don't, I don't really, I have words and I've told him, you know, face to face and I'm not trying to just put him over, but I'm just really speaking okay. uh, from, yeah, from, from my heart, from, you know, what I've known of this man since I met him in 2011. Yeah. Uh, he is one of the best to ever do it really truly yeah. and he needs the i feel like he needs the respect for how he's made so many careers so many people are out there who love professional wrestling because he helped put somebody on the mat mm -hmm. that they wouldn't otherwise know that's a, and, and and it takes somebody special to do that because how many people are afraid of losing their spots you know Absolutely. Absolutely. So he, you know, he still does what he does. And that's why I still go back to him, you know, right now. And that's why I called him today. Like, listen, I'm having this issue. Uh, what do you suggest? Because he is the right person. He will tell you the right answer in his sleep because yeah. professional wrestling. He's a heck and of a mentor for you to have. I mean, he, that's why I said, you know, I said, I told him, I was like, you need to just write me a referral, <laughs> <laughs> a, a reference letter, like, so I can just give it to everybody because you are the person who has taught me everything. And I feel like that gives me more brownie points because I learned from somebody so great at the very beginning. Yeah. As opposed to going through a whole bunch of different people and then getting to him. This is where I started. I yeah. started with Tommy Dreamer, who had Sandman teach me stuff. Who had I had all the ECW boys just teaching me stuff. Like, I'm just a little kid. Like, what do I do now? <laughs> you know, uncles. It's just <laughs> that, that kind of thing. Like Armageddon. Like, you know, how Liv Tyler was. Yeah. She had all her uncles. The ECW guys, that's that's them for me. Think about that platform, man. How many people are blessed enough to have that East, that extreme locker room, you know, break them in and teach them? That's like you said, because nine times out of ten, when you get in the business, you're taught by this guy, you're taught, but you're picking up this guy, this guy, you're but to have those guys that have been through it, I mean, that's a heck of a way to start right there. Yeah, to 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 work with those people. I mean, do you know the guys from now, Vic and Hale? I don't think so. Okay, well, they call themselves the now. They've 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 been making their their splash recently. They were staples in House of Hardcore. Yeah, and uh, me and my daughter actually were their valets for okay. the long 
time. And then we, you know, we, we did something where we kind of moved on. Uh, Vic was in an accident and he never thought he'd wrestle again. And he has his comeback story because he's actually wrestling and he is in great shape now. He lost weight. It's just, um, so they're making their rounds on the, on the, the indie circuits and the, you know, on television too. And I think that they're going to hopefully make them their way up to WWE. Vic and Hale, I'm going to check them out, man. I'm yep. going to, you know. They're called The Now. I still have now. my shirt. Yep, The Now. Uh, the Now. Yep. Okay, I would definitely put that over and uh, check that out tonight as as I lay down. But listen, we're going to finish up because, I mean, you have, you've got a big day ahead tomorrow. I've just got a few. Um, we're going to end with horror. And I'm going to ask okay. you your favorite sequel to each movie here. It's a, it's a sequel. It's a little bit of a curveball, you know. I wanted to give you a, something, a, something a little different. Nightmare on Elm Street. Which sequel would you say was your favorite? <laughs> Why did you say not Nightmare? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you just ruined it for me there because because I love some of the sequels from Nightmare on Elm Street. I. I'm not a sequel girl. Yeah. I don't. So. Yeah, no, I don't. I I, I can't think of Nair Nutta one. I think that it's you either did your homework or you or it's just how you feel because you said not Nightmare on Elm Street. But for me, it's definitely not all of the sequels from Nightmare on Elm Street. Um, the third one specifically, Dream Warriors. right? No, no, no. Dream no, Warriors. no, no. I, I said nightmare on. I didn't say not nightmare on Elm Street. Oh, you said. Oh, okay. I thought you said not. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> I'm sorry. Dream Warriors. Would you say that was your favorite? Yes. Yes. That per, that that specific one. Um, it could have been a one of my one. top one of my tops of the nightmare on Elm street sequels, because there's a couple, Yeah. but dream warriors was really cool to me. I love I, it. Yes. I like, I like what they did with that. And I also, um, I guess is kind of not fair because, you know, talking to some of the people who did the movie and learning some of the, you know, the ins and outs of it made me love it even more. Um, you know, I know Ken Sagos, uh, who was in Dream Warriors yeah. and, and he, you know, he, we, we've talked a lot about it. Uh, I actually, I've met most of the cast that's, that was in that, but I love Dream Warriors. I do too. And I love the Dawkins song also. I thought it had a great soundtrack, the song, you know, Dream yes. Warriors. And yeah. you know, I'm a fan. I mean, I'm going to take a lot of heat for it, but I kind of liked Freddie's Dead. I mean, I guess it was where I was younger at the time, and it was the first movie I wasn't scared to watch. Well, you, I mean, it's Alice okay Cooper. if you take heat for it. It's you like what you like. It was yeah. okay. It wasn't like great. Right. Yeah. I guess I think I have a lot. It's like Friday the 13th, part seven. That was the first movie, scary movie I went to the theaters and watched. And my mom took me because we couldn't get a babysitter, and my older brothers went. And she thought I wouldn't realize what was going on. Well, I cried and screamed the whole movie, but that started my love affair with the genre. So thanks, mom. I always thank her for that. See, the fog did it for me, the original fog. My brother said the fog growing up, he said the fog was the scariest movie he had ever seen. Yes, me too. That's that's the movie that really ignited my fear and love for the horror genre was the fog. I like kind of, you know, I want to say weird, obscure stuff because even Christine scared me. Oh, I was yeah. like, I didn't want to get in anybody's car because I was like, this car is not about to take me <laughs> where I don't want to go and do stuff that, you know, but I didn't, being younger, I didn't really understand the intricacies of the movie. Yeah. I just knew that that car was alive to me. <laughs> About like maximum overdrive when all the vehicles are <laughs> operating on their own with their own minds and stuff. Right. So those were the movies that actually 
scared me and wanted me and and I wanted to know more about the genre, you know, the exorcist. But then again, who didn't, who wasn't scared by the exorcist? Yeah. I'm going to uh, give you an odd, I'm going to ask you a question here. And it, well, I guess I'll give a statement and it might be unpopular, but to me, the exorcist three was scarier than the original. You think so? I'm in a, I, I'm in a, when I listen, you know, I've painted myself up like the Pazuzu demon before my matches from the original exorcist. So no, I see part three more as a psychological thriller. There's nothing as scary as being okay. Yes. 14 well, year old up seeing that <laughs> like at two in the morning, turning it on. And you see uh Linda Blair, like her head. I mean, it just, yeah, you're right. Yeah. There's nothing beats the exorcist. Well, you're right. I guess it depends upon the type of horror that you're more going for. Yeah. Because yes, that one was more psychological, but it would be better for somebody who's more into something that's psychological. Like somebody Saturday. that's yeah, somebody that's looking more for the I, I don't want to say flash, but you know, all the head turning, throwing yeah. up, all of you know, that thing that might scare some people more than the psychological i love um all types of horror so it just depends i would have to put things in categories because see i'm also a takashi Mike fan yeah. so when you said psychological i thought about audition which yeah. to me is totally a psychological horror yeah that is really pretty mundane until it gets to the latter part of the the movie where all of the real crazy stuff happens. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you know how much you if you like Takashi Mike or or whatever, but you know, it's like that movie that he did versus Ichi the Killer, where you have blood spraying all over the place, which is one of Quentin Tarantino's um, you know, people that he he loved as well. Yeah. So you have these two different things. You have psychological and then you have the flash of the horror. So it just depends on what it is that you like. I like all of it. Me too. I, I mean, I'm <laughs> I'm all over the uh, spectrum with it, man. I mean, I could, I'll tell you, let's go Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It is, I think it, I think that that embodies kind of both. Yeah psychological and you know just like straight up uh i don't want to say flash for, for lack of a better term i'm using you know flash flashy yeah. killing but i think that that embodies both that's interesting that you said that because i never thought about that that way until you just said it now part you know you talked about the fog being the movie that got you in love with uh the genre with me it was part three of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre because I was four years old. I walk in, my mom's like, go get your brother. He's in his friends. So I walk into the house and, to tell my brother, come on, my mom, or your, our mom's out here to get you. And like him and his friends are teenagers and they're watching part three. And I walk in and my eyes hit the TV and it's the scene where he has the big gold chainsaw. And yes. Dick Mortensen's in the, in the kitchen and, I mean, he's swinging it around and I'm like, man, my eyes, like, I never, like, it was like magnets. And I was like, man, I've got to go rent this. And I'm a kid, you know. And once I rented part three, I think I was four years old. I just, man, I've met Gunnar Hansen, all right, me, me and R.A. Mihailoff, good friends. Um, yeah. Dan Bigger. I've, a lot of the actors that have portrayed Leatherface are actually on a, you know, they're guests on this show. So, I mean, a lot of the, it's crazy in this life. I mean, it is, you know, you grow up. It is, it <laughs> is. And it, I, you know, I feel the same way and I know all of those guys, yeah. you know, I've, we've done some convention times or times where you get to really uh, connect with people, especially when you're both guests and you just get to like be in the green room or like kind of talking and, and connect it, it's one of those kind of things that happens, but yeah, it's a, uh, that's crazy. Right. Just yeah. there's movies that, you know, I've watched and I see, and I'm just like, I was totally disgusted by this in a good way. And then I would meet these people, you know, just even um, the X-Files, which 
I, you know, I know is is sci-fi. Yeah. But meeting David Duchovny and um, Lily. Is it uh, Dana? Uh, Dana. Uh, I can't remember her 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 name now. But yeah, oh, and I, I always thought meet. she was beautiful. I always thought she was a pretty. Yes, she is. Uh, I got to meet both of them in person because we were doing a convention uh, all together and we were just in a green room and that's where everybody, I mean, convened to sit and talk. And I was just like, this is so crazy that I am a fan of X-Files and I'm here because of Lloyd Kaufman and I'm sitting back here with these people. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, just all of the the crazy and then i went back and did like a whole x files marathon when i got back home i also met the um what what's the cigarette smoking man's name uh god dang it but uh, you know what i'm talking about yeah. right jillian anderson okay. jillian anderson yeah. oh jillian anderson jillian, is, so, yeah. is, is yes i, knew, I see I... It, that came to you late i'm just like i I was wanting to, why was I wanting to say, what was the girl's name that was the ring announcer for WWE all those? Lillian Garcia. Why oh, was yeah, I thinking no. That? No, it's not Lillian Garcia. No, it's Jillian <laughs> Anderson. No, Lillian Garcia, who I sang with in New Orleans during uh, WrestleMania one year. Uh, the, see, the, all it all ties together to me. Yeah. Uh, Tommy calls it crazy brain, like the crazy wrestling brain. You start tying everything that happens in your life with something wrestling. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I keep doing. That's what you did. Oh, yeah. I'm the same <laughs> way, man. I've been that way since I was a kid. You though. said <laughs> Lillian Garcia's for Jillian Anderson. So, yeah, you you're, you're, you tie it all together. Well, listen, I am so thankful that you agreed to come on here tonight. I hope I didn't make it too miserable for you. Uh. <laughs> nope. It's been awesome, actually. I appreciate you. Oh, man, I appreciate you. And hopefully we may do a part two to this uh, on down the road yeah. if you're cool with it. I'm and I just want to commend you on being a great mother also. Uh, like, I'm a big family guy. I mean, I'm, I'm all about family. And you are too. And I, I keep up with yes. you. And, you know, you and your husband's got – y'all are just uh, together a lot, man. And that's the way me and my wife are, you know. And that's – you know, you see, man, you've got a lot of similarities there going on. And Yeah, we do. You're a great yeah, mother. You're great. Uh, you're a great craft. What would you say? A craft uh, maker? I don't know. I don't even know what to call it. I just like to, I just like to create. Well, you do, do. A, you do a wonderful job and get you some sleep because you've got a big day tomorrow. Where are you flying to? Uh, PR, uh, Illinois. I'm, I'm doing new wrestling revolution in, uh, on Saturday. So, you know, we have to fly in a little bit early because I also do like social media stuff for them and uh, all of that stuff, like kind of doing the house of hardcore thing. So I have to come in a day early and Saturday we're doing the show. If anybody's in the Illinois area. Now, Gada, how can people reach you or check you out? Where can they see you? At? Uh, well, social media, like how would they Instagram, Facebook, uh, the quickest way to find all my social media is to just Google Monique Dupree because okay. you'll find my Twitter, which is the original Gata, but people mix it up. My Facebook is the true original Gata. It's verified. Um, I have like almost a million followers there. Holy cow. I, I don't even know why. Um, <laughs> I don't. I really don't. Uh, or my Twitter, which is the, uh, yeah, the original Gata, my Instagram got hacked, so I have a new Instagram, and it is Monique Gata Dupree. Um, that is verified now as well. So, I mean, just look for Monique Dupree. Well, listen, hopefully I can get a hold of a promoter, get you down here, and me and you'll take on somebody, and uh, we'll get you in the great state of the bluegrass of Kentucky. That would be cool. I would love that. <laughs> listen, okay. everybody, thank you for tuning in again. The beautiful the thought original gotta i've been struggling with yep. that monique Dupree, okay. the renaissance lady as i've been calling her she's done it all and she's going to keep doing it i'm i'm hoping that when she's like 80 years old and i'm 75 i'm reaching out saying you ready to do another podcast but yep 
Tonight's broadcast has been brought by Bose Tractor Works Appalachian 11. We need to send you some of this. This is amazing stuff for your muscles, your joints. I mean, I'm blown away. Like, he comes, this guy's a good friend of mine. It's CBD cream. He brought it to the show. He goes to wrestling shows and he gives it to us, all us guys that's been banged up, bumped all over the place. And I'm not even lying. Like, I'm one of the guys that don't fake the funk. And this stuff really works. And we'll have to get you some of that, Monique. And Please do, because I, Jesus, I need it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, I mean, we had an elderly lady, like I said last night at the basketball game. My son was there. We were, and people in the, like all the people from the school was putting it on their shoulders or back. But the elderly lady went, you know, her daughter took her to the bathroom and put it on her hip. As soon as they come back, uh, her daughter was like, where can we buy this at? Because she's already feeling better. And I'm like, I'll take care of you. Don't worry about it. So, so we're going to definitely, I'm going to talk to Bo Matheny from Bo's Tractor Works. We're going to get you some sent out to you. Uh, thank you for being on, man. And uh, God bless you. And you have a good time tomorrow. You take, listen, the human horror movie is going to be with you in spirit at the wrestling show. So you take care. Everybody, Monique Dupree. Tune in next time. Share, subscribe, like, and all that stuff. Thank you, guys.